security. The role of voluntary work became even more important with the number of refugees or asylum seekers increased in Finland uh, in 2015. Uh, we know you were really involved in that work as well. So what are uh, some of the challenges and barriers for integration in your country and consequently, what measures have been taken uh, by the civil society particularly to ease your refugees' inclusion? Well, thank you. Can you all? <laughs> thank you. I guess you can hear me now. Hi, everyone. Hi, how are you all doing? That's, that's awesome to hear. I hope you still have a little bit of energy left to listen to my presentation. It's a great honor to be here today and try to share some of my experience and ideas with all of you. And I'm looking forward to some tough questions and productive dialogue after our presentations. So to answer your question, I would like to start with some background information to give you a general idea of what happened in Finland. So in 2015, we got over 30,000 asylum seekers to Finland. 8,500 of these were minors, and over 3,000 of these people were unaccompanied refugee minors. So this sudden increase in asylum seekers led to a number of challenges. Because we were, we were not ready, we didn't expect this to happen. And now I'm going to elaborate a little bit about some challenges that happen in the context of, of uh, integrating young refugees into our society. So one challenge that is, for me, very unfortunate to talk about today is the discrimination, racism, and hate speech that has been directed towards these young refugees in Finland. We have also recently received uh, recommendations from the Universal Periodic Review to kind of come up with efforts to build a better society and, and combat these, these things that are happening, this racism and, and discrimination in our society. And in case you don't know what, what the UPR is, it's a, it's a review. It's where the member states of the UN review other states and especially the human rights situation in the country. So we are really aware of these challenges and what's happening in Finland. And I personally think that as a first step to, to make the situation better in Finland, we should try to abolish these negative attitudes that people in the country have about refugees and, and young refugees that are trying to come to our country to, to build a new life and, and, and really need the support of, of us. And I think this can be, be done by, by uh, increasing cultural understanding. And this is where we, the youth organizations, really chip in. And we have had a strong role in, in building bridges between native youth and these young refugees that have come to our country. For example, my uh, background organization, the UN Youth Association of Finland, has organized a workshop on the sustainable development goals to these young refugees. And this has really been an incredible experience for, for us to kind of have this, this um, opportunity to learn from each other and build these, these bridges. We also have a number of, of other NGOs that have organized similar activities for young refugees, for example, sports and arts cl clubs and uh, other leisure activities. So there's a lot going on. We are really active in, in Finland when it comes to, to voluntary work. Okay, thank you, Emilia. I think you gave us some examples of what youth can do also to promote inclusion. And on not only talking about refugees, but in general about victims of the armed conflict. We can actually say the same about, for instance, Colombia, uh, where we are in the middle of, of a society that is divided by war. So I think this is a great example for all the young people uh, youth leaders to promote this kind of initiatives uh, in other places affected by different kind of conflicts, not only armed conflict. So, Emilia, 
what are the links uh, between refugee integration and the broader youth peace and security agenda, especially related to the prevention of violence? Well, for me, this link is definitely inclusiveness. The 2250 resolution is as important in peaceful countries such as Finland than it is in unstable areas. And inclusiveness, this is a prerequisite for a peaceful society. And I also think that we can use this youth peace and security agenda as a tool to create more inclusiveness in our societies. Now you might be thinking to yourself like how, how are we going to do this? Does anyone have any ideas? No? Well, I have one. Um, in my opinion, we could do this by guaranteeing equal opportunities for all youth to participate. And I want to give you some concrete examples about this, what we have done in Finland. In Finland, we, we created a network on, on youth peace and security in 2016. And this is a network that brings together youth organizations and young people that are interested in building peace and a more inclusive society. And these people come together to advocate for this 2250 resolution. And we are really proud of our, our network. And other, um, another effort when it comes concretely to advocacy, what can you do when you advocate for youth peace and security? As an example, I would like to mention a really recent project that uh, the UN Youth of Finland has had the honor to partner up with, um, with World FUNA and also some other, um, some other youth, UN Youth Associations. It's, um, it's a collaboration that, that we have done starting, it, it started uh, this, this year in, in early, early January, if I remember correctly. And uh, the, the, the thing that we did was a social media campaign on the 2250. And you might have seen it when, when you came in today. Uh, it was playing on the screens earlier. And uh, I really hope that, that you will, uh, if you didn't see it, you will check it out on, on social media, on, on World Funa's um, social media, and also UN Finland um, has it, or, or UN, the UN Association of Finland, uh, it's also run, uh, going around in our social media channels. And we hope that uh, as many as possible will, um, will participate, because we're actually, the idea of the, of the social media campaign is to challenge all youth to kind of take action when it comes to this youth peace and security agenda. Thank you. So thanks, Emilia. You just gave us an, an example of how or, or what can youth do uh, to take action of a resolution. No? So a resolution is, let's say, it's like the legal framework but uh, we all have the responsibility, the governments, the civil society, all different sectors of the society to implement the agenda. Uh, we have finished uh, with, the, with the speakers, so I'm going to open the floor for, for the Q&A questions. We have maybe a space for two questions maximum. And uh, I think uh, the first question is coming from the you know, Corel, who works at the International Labour Organization. Dina, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for giving me the floor and also for your very, very interesting and inspiring insights. Um, I just wanted to very briefly highlight that um, this um, theme that is being discussed today comes actually at a very opportune moment for the International Labour Organization because two um, months ago, the International Labour Conference adopted a new um, recommendation on employment and decent work for peace and resilience. And this recommendation provides guidance on promoting, promoting decent work opportunities and in response to crisis arising from um, conflict and disasters. And it pays special attention to the protection, education, and training of children and young people in situations of conflict. 
I would be very interested in your perspectives on the role of education um, in this regard and how young people can be better involved. Thank you very much again. So who wants to start? Martin? Uh, thank you again uh, for that point. Um, I think in terms of the, the, to correct me if I'm wrong, it's the, the role of education in, in building young people to be change makers and, and build reconciliation and peace in their communities. I think uh, we actually have to get to the root of it. And the root of it is the traditional algorithm for education. Uh, memorize, repeat, score, maybe get a job, maybe get a good reputation. That traditional algorithm is not relevant in a world of constant change and disruption. So we have to recalibrate that and actually support visionary educators who are going beyond the scores and you know the, the pressures of being an educator and actually value, valuing and promoting uh, a new literacy, a new literacy that values empathy just as important as knowing two plus two equals four, uh, as valuing failure, not just I did really well in school and you know I have a good reputation in the education community. I think valuing these change maker skills when it comes to empathy, creative collaboration, new leadership, failure, and all these things, and also interpersonal communications is crucial. Um, I think a key thing in youth and education is that youth, young people, I think all of us, um, we should feel like we're in charge of our education. Um, education in the traditional sense is pretty top down. There is not a lot of support for teachers and educators who cultivate a classroom that is collaborative, where young people are also in charge of the narrative of their education journey. And I think the last point I would make is there's a blind spot. Uh, with how we engage young people generally. The blind spot is when it comes to the social and emotional needs of a young person stepping into a space. For instance, a lot of the at-risk youth I work with, if they hear a door shut in the back of the room, they go into a state of mental paralysis. If you ask them a question, they go into a state of paralysis and start to cry or start to be violent with the person next to them. There are things that have to happen in the internal space. The internal dialogue of a young person needs to be addressed and supported because that internal dialogue of the young person will lead to actual impacts in the real world. What's happening on the inside translates to what's happening right here in front of us. And I think we have to support initiatives that are promoting that internal dialogue and that internal social and emotional development and learning. Um, I think that's crucial. Thank you, Mosin. Thank you, Marcin. Emilia? Thank you. I definitely uh, echo everything that Martin said, said here and uh, agree to that, or at least in my opinion, education is the key to peace. And I think in, in the world that we live now, we really have to start thinking outside the box, to start thinking about new and creative measures, how we can educate youth. We need to build partnerships between different sectors to do this. Otherwise, I, I think we, we might have some problems in, in a few years. So I think we have to act now and not tomorrow. And to kind of link this to my country context, um, human rights education and education on peace is a really big thing in Finland. That's, that's, that's something that we think is really important. And we have, we have put this, we have included human rights education in our, in our national action plan on human rights. And I believe we're, we're one of the first countries in the world that has done this. So I, I really wish, or my, my kind of like hope and message to, to all member states and, and leaders is to, to do something like this to recognize the role of human rights and peace education and come together and try to build creative ways to educate our youth. Thank you. I would like to also to, to participate in this question. I, I would like to think about education also in different ways, not the formal, but also other uh, ways 
to educate. Uh, in Colombia, as I work for the United Nations Development Program there, we support youth initiatives to promote or to educate in peace, to promote culture of peace, the values associated to peace. Uh, but we do it in a different way because we do it in the, I mean, in, with the mechanisms, with the methodologies, and the ideas developed by their own uh, young leaders. So it's not it's not a traditional workshop. It's uh, it's arts, it's music, it's sports, it's theater, and and so on. So I think uh, if that education is the key to change uh, the patterns of violence, to stop reproducing violence, and to learn how to reproduce peace. So I think the same that my dear college about education is the key because we can look how that can let us materialize all our initiatives and our proposals. So because I think that the current education uh, doesn't answer to the needs of the students, of the children, of the youth, because we are living in a world who is changing faster every day, who requires of different needs, who requires of numerous way to educate. So I think that the traditional education needs to be changed. We need to accept other alternative education ways. We need to try to promote an education for citizenship, for coexistence for peace that can allow to the students develop and strengthen different skills and abilities to can promote in their communities the peace, the sustainable development, and many other things. So I think that the education maybe can be the, the key factor to can talk about peace, for example, in Colombia, because we can conceive the peace process and the successful peace process in the future if we, for example, don't change our way to educate in where we teach to the students that maybe the bad actor of the conflict always is a guerrilla, when maybe the people who is, make, is being part of this conflict can be uh, there for uh, another cause like the forced recruitment. So we need to think that we need to educate to the new generations uh, based on our history to try to don't repeat our mistakes, to try to ensure the no repetition of the violence, as Juliana said, and that we need to be sure that the peaceful society is possible, but only if the education is the key and the way to can educate peaceful next generations. Hiya. Yes, thank you. Well, I think that my colleagues covered everything since I'm the last one, but I really have um, very little thing to say that one time I saw a photo of um, a teacher teaching students after the Hiroshima bomb. I don't know if anyone here saw it. The buildings were completely destroyed and there was no school. And then they just got chairs and tables around those uh, uh, destroyed buildings and there was a teacher teaching them. And this photo really inspired me that they really understood that education is the most important thing to build a nation. And we all know what Japan, what kind of, what a country Japan is now and how developed Japan is. And this was really an inspiration. So my only sentence to say here is that I really want us to treat education as a right and not as a privilege, because really so many people treat it as a privilege. Even for so many countries, like in Syria, right now with the conflict that's happening, Priority is always given to relief and to aid, but I don't think education is any less. I think that it is a right and not a privilege. Thank you. One more question. Mother just want to say something to all of you. It's been such a joy for me as an elder, intergenerational, here with you today. And I just want to say to all of you, stay on the sacred path of life. Read within your own heart and spirit and do what you must do. You are who we are waiting for. We are waiting for you to take the leadership and shape the world for world peace. And education is what you spoke about today. Continue your education, whether formal 
or informal education and continue to learn from each other. The world is in your hands. And as an elder, I'm going to pass the legacy today to all of you. And thank you for allowing me to speak to you as an elder today of intergenerational. Just all clap. <laughs> You had, uh, do you ask for? Doesn't work? Um, huh? um, I'm Kimberly. Um, I'm a global team with the YMCA of Greater New York. And we spent the past few months learning about the SDGs. And we, all of us, we recently went on a trip um, to three different places, Haiti, Washington, and California, to learn more about the SDGs. Um, but it's a similar question as before. Um, being where you guys are right now, um, what are the biggest challenges or obstacles you guys faced? Thank you. Someone wants to answer first? Or Haya, do you want to start? OK, thank you for giving me the turn this time. Um, I think that the biggest challenge uh, I faced was people did not really believe that we could do something. So I remember that I wanted to really uh, study politics and just get involved in these things. When I was 14 years old, I read a book and it really inspired me. And then everybody was like, you cannot do anything. Politics is so dirty and it's not your place. And I really decided not to, not to listen to these talks and I really believed in myself. So. Very simple, just simply saying it, just believe in yourself and there will be so many people who will try to let you down. And you will also think that me as an individual, I cannot do some, something to change what's happening. Like for me, there's war in Syria. And I personally sometimes feel very desperate sometimes that I cannot do something for my country. But the mere fact that I'm here today uh, uh, sharing my stories with you is really something that I never ever thought I would be able to do. But it really inspires me to continue and to do more. Thank you. Uh, Julian, would you like to add something? Okay, so I think that uh, maybe you had three main challenges due uh, related with peace building societies. I think that one of them is the indifference of the citizenship and the less confidence in the youth because maybe the people or the adult people think that we can make any kind of change in the society. So we need to try to spread our empowerment in the communities to try to demonstrate that we can do it. And in this regard, we need to try to promote the generational replacement because the problem is how the traditional leaders don't want to leave the power of the youth or the roles of power in the society. So we need to try to demonstrate and be sure that we can continue allowing that the traditional leaders take decisions by us and all the time the same traditional leaders is taking decision for the next generation. So we think that maybe the generational replacement is a solution to can tackle the indifference and the confidence of the people because when the people understand that we have the creative required to can change the society, that the young people is also an important actor to can dynamize the society and propose new things. In this moment, the world is going to change. So I think that that's the most important uh, challenge to be solved right now. Thank you. <laughs> Emilia, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I would like to say a few words about voluntary work and youth voluntary work. I've been active now myself for almost seven years, and uh, a lot of this time I have been spending coordinating voluntary groups. Something I've noticed, a big challenge, is to keep people engaged, because it's voluntary, right? You don't get paid for it. And I think this is, this is something you might recognize also if, if you have been volunteering, that, that you start off with a project, you have 10 people, but then in the end, you're like two left. Um, so it's, it's a challenge. But my message to you would be the following. It's us, the youth. We have the power to actually make a difference. So if you're a volunteer, I think it's, it's kind of 
important to recognize your responsibility. If you're committed to something, you should really follow through. I think this is, this is really important to re remember. We're on a mission together. If we actually want to make the world a better place, I know this is a cliche, but I have to say it, we have to stick together. We have to build partnerships and networks, not only na nationally, but also internationally. Th this is the way, this is what I believe in, partnerships. And I, I think this, this campaign that uh, we have been working on with, with World FUNA, the 2250 social media campaign, is a really good example of a partnership that started with a simple idea, but became an international campaign. So I feel like if, if I, I can do it and our association can do, do this, everyone can do this. We, we can all make a difference if we just come together and build partnerships. Thank you. Thank you. Marcin, you would like to add something? Yeah, please. Uh, I hope I answered your question correctly. Um, I think the, the first thing, the first challenge is uh, giving yourself permission. Uh, give yourself permission to dream loud. Give yourself permission to fail hard. All right, and then give yourself permission to transfer that doubt, that fear, that negativity, and use it and transform it into a force that will break walls so that the people behind you don't have to walk around another wall because that wall isn't there anymore. All right, so there's that internal mindset shift that needs to happen. That mindset shift is ownership. I think with the SDGs, one of the challenges we face is that not everybody feels ownership of an SDG because the problems are so big. So you have to give yourself permission now, like my previous brothers and sisters you know, in the previous panel said, give yourself permission now to dream loud, fail hard, form a team, and get back up again and be resilient as hell because the world is on fire and that's what it requires. I would also add that uh, the other challenge though too, if I'm talking about working with at-risk and marginalized youth, this space, these, these kids are change makers. They don't need you or me to tell them that they're change makers. They are living, breathing change makers. There's a challenge that comes from the youth influencers around a young person, where the space for an at-risk or marginalized youth to be a change maker is shrinking. But that passion to be a change maker is still there. So the systems, whether it's the education system that's only valuing scores and traditional literacy, that needs to change. Value empathy and change making. How employees, again, how companies hire kids and value Employees, that needs to change. All the systems around a young person also need to change. And I think the way that the adult space approaches young people is that they always say, oh, yeah, you, got, you guys can do this, you guys can do that. But wait a second. Part of the algorithm here is you have to do the same thing because the world is different than what it was when you were growing up. And we can't be afraid to say that anymore. Say it. Unleash it. Right? And we're all in this together so you won't be alone and in trouble. Right? You've got thousands and thousands of people behind you saying the same thing. So I, that's what I would say to that question. Okay, uh, we have to close now the discussion. I just want to add maybe one comment. Uh, like these initiatives that we have seen through this morning, uh, there are many, many, I hope thousands of youth-led initiatives that tries to build peace, promote reconciliation inclusion, the respect for human rights, etc., etc. I, I, I want to make an invitation is that uh, keep on moving, keep on working, don't give up. We are here also as the United Nations and the different agencies to support your ideas, your work, your projects. Uh, we are partners on this. So thanks a lot to you. Uh, you are 